Welcome back to another episode of the Six Piece Podcast. Today we're delving back into the film High Ground and we'll be focusing on film techniques. Just to run through the basics, I guess, of film techniques, these must be analysed in order to showcase your understanding of how the text is made or how the text is constructed. And this is particularly important in both the SAC because it is on the rubric and the exam because the examiners will definitely be looking at for film techniques and how you employ these in your essays. Think back to Marbo and the meta language that we used when we analysed that film, including aspects like voiceovers, long shots, close ups, mise en scène, and flashbacks. These are also, or these also appear in high ground. Whenever you are using film techniques, I would like you to consider the directorial intent. So think about what messages Johnson is sending to the audience by using specific techniques. Now, we're going to run through a few film techniques today, but this is by no means every film technique that's used in this film. So use this as a starting point, a place where you can think back and revise over what you already know and then use this in your analysis when you go back and watch the film a second, third, fourth time and see if you can pick out little choices and decisions that Johnson has made and the reasoning or the purpose behind those changes. Let's start with, I guess, the one that we know pretty well, which is a close up, which is the name suggests is a close up of the character's face or in fact, a close up of any object really. It could even be a character's feet if that happened to be important, say. Uh, the example we've got here is a close-up of Claire and Guchuk. We see their reactions when the mob arrives at the mission to negotiate, so DARPA and Moran's meeting. In the explanation here, we've obviously got our verb. Johnson magnifies the facial expression of Guchuk, Claire, Travis, Eddie, Moran and DARPA during the negotiations in order to highlight the tension between the two sides while also illustrating the individual's emotions. Moran's indifference to DARPA's words and Claire's despondent reaction to Guchuk emphasised their contrasting feelings about First Nations people. Uh, again, I'd probably want to focus on you know one or two characters in this scene. There's a list of characters, but I'd probably focus on just one or two in this case. What you'll hopefully notice in the explanation is the explanation verbs are present. So too is the director's name because it is Stephen Johnson that is employing or utilising or implementing these film techniques. So, from a close up to a long shot. This is obviously a view that is shot from a far distance, so the characters appear distant from the audience, or they're pictured against the setting or the landscape or the backdrop. Uh, the example here is when Guchuk sees Baywater for the first time after he burnt down the station. The explanation here is that Guchuk's perspective of Baywater is illustrated with a long shot to emulate the cultural distance and difference between him and his uncle. The distant camera provides a sense of fear through anonymity. The long shot also provides greater sense of destruction. He has caused the flames representing Baywater's anger. Something here to consider as well is the fact that we don't see Baywater's face and actually in this scene, it is Moran's voice over. So we do get uh, Moran's version of Baywater burning down the station or the wild mob burning down the station. Something that's pretty unique to this film, I guess, are the amount of drone shots that are used. Um, you'll see in the definition also sort of bird's eye view shots at times, particularly when we are traveling with Travis and Guchuk. In this scene, we see birds flying across the land, and you could say this emphasizes the importance of nature and land for First Nations people. Johnson highlights the beauty and expansive nature of it and provides the audience with a different perspective of Arnhem Land. The way the birds are flying together reflects the freedom of nature First Nations people knew before colonization. The last of our shots, I guess, that we're going to focus on is a point of view shot, also known as a POV shot, but please remember um, to spell the full word out. And this is obviously a film angle that shows what a character is looking at to the audience. So the audience shares that character's perspective. The example throughout the film particularly is through the crosshairs of a rifle. So we see Travis a number of times and Guchuk a couple of times as well, looking through the crosshairs of a rifle. The explanation 
Johnson provides the audience with Travis's perspective as he watches women and children playing in the water through a rifle lens. The juxtaposition is jarring and positions them as extremely vulnerable, them being the First Nations people. Subsequently, the audience is provided with a similar shot, but of a crocodile illustrating the societal view that First Nations people are treated as fauna and the fact that they too are actually hunted, much like we saw with the officers in the opening massacre. We'll move on to editing now. And editing is a great film technique because it is in every single scene. It's the way the scenes are ordered and cut together. So really think about pacing and timing when it comes to editing and why certain shots and sequences are in the order that they are in. In this case, we've got the example of when the station men escape and are being chased by the police and station owners. The quick changes in frame views highlights the desperation and urgency that the men are in. It simultaneously builds tensions and foreshadows the chaotic scene about to unfold. Something as well you could consider when it comes to editing is sound because sometimes there will be cuts in this film from really loud and chaotic scenes to quieter scenes and the juxtaposition there as well, particularly between, say, the officers and the First Nations people. But really think about the ordering of the scenes and how they're edited together. All right, let's look at some camera angles. We'll start with high camera angles. And we saw one of these earlier on when we had the point of view shot from Travis's perspective through the rifle crosshairs looking down at the women and children playing. So that's a great example of how two film techniques can work together and they definitely don't work in isolation. We've got a different high camera angle example here. Obviously high camera angle means when the camera looks down on someone or something. In this case, it is Eddie looking down on Travis. Johnson starts with a low shot of Eddie standing over a wounded Travis portraying the newfound power dynamic between the two. He then switches the perspective to a high angled shot relative to Travis's position on the ground, emphasizing his helplessness. And the wording's not great there, but you get the gist of that particular example and explanation of high camera angles. And we move to the opposite, which is low camera angles, taken from low looking up at someone or something. In this case, it's Eddie looking down at Kuchuk. The camera is facing up at Eddie, who is in an advantageous position with his hand wrapped around Guchuk's neck. The camera angle illustrates the imbalance of power, which is in Eddie's favour, and echoes that of wider Australian society, where non-Indigenous people hold power. Note to it emphasises his violent nature and the way that he resorts to that in order to maintain his power. Flashbacks is an interesting film technique. We obviously saw it in Marbo last year. We're seeing it again here. It is more of a structural feature, I guess, and you could too link this in with editing in terms of the way the scenes are sequenced. So obviously flashback is a scene that happens in an earlier time, either in the film or in the character's life. And in this case, the flashback is when Guchuk has a memory of practicing to hunt with his uncle. Could even be DARPA, whose voiceover is in this particular scene as well. So as DARPA recounts Baywater's potential to be our greatest teacher, a flashback is employed to showcase him guiding and teaching Guchuk. The contrast between this scene and the wild mob's actions in burning down the station illustrate the significant shift in Baywater's temperament due to the massacre. You could say with this particular scene as well, it assists in Guchuk, so this is Guchuk in resolving his psychomachia, his internal conflict on who to follow whether to follow his uncle, Anglewoody, or whether to follow his grandfather's words. Note to when it comes, obviously, to flashbacks, or in this case, particularly, we have a voiceover working as well. And in this particular example, they've also embedded a quotation in the explanation. And that is a really, really good thing to do. Try and weave in a quotation alongside a film technique or two. Costume is obviously what a character is wearing. The example we'll use here is a meeting between DARPA and Moran. 
Johnson purposely employs features onto the wild mob, such as makeup and tribal gear and or clothing on the members of the wild mob in order to elicit the cultural difference between the two sides. In contrast, the officers are clothed in formal and clean attire to demonstrate their authority and power. Johnson does this in order to highlight the contrasting cultures between the two groups. Yeah, that's solid analysis. Um, I think you could go a step further here as well. Um, note how the, in this case, the wild mob seem to blend in with nature and are at one with nature, whereas Moran's costume is really ill-suiting for the environment here as well. Um, he's wearing white, which you could say is quite ironic, given the fact he's not an innocent individual. And the fact that, you know, he sort of wears medals and, and, and a hat as well shows his inflexibility or his unwillingness to compromise. So that explanation, once again, is solid, but you could go into more detail there with that explanation. Let's look at lighting. It refers to light, just a tip. Um, yes, you definitely have bright or natural lighting. Please avoid the term dark lighting, though. Um, I prefer dim lighting. I, there's something about dark lighting that I don't think makes sense. It's a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, there's a lot of scenes that take place at night as well. So think about scenes that happen during the day and scenes that happen at night and the atmosphere that is created due to the lighting in both scenes. Look at this example. It's when the wild mob sets fire to a camp or a station and Gutchuk witnesses his uncle Baywara in the shadows. Explanation, the dim lighting from the fire in this scene emphasises the contrast of the fire with the night's dark background, accentuating the destruction intensity of the scene. Scenes shot at night also provide a more sinister atmosphere as depicted through conversations which regularly occur at night by campfires. Please avoid uh, groupings. I don't really like when you sort of group scenes all together. Pick specific scenes and, you know, really delve into them in, in greater detail rather than being surfacey. But again, um, lighting is a really easy film technique to sort of use um, because it's pretty straightforward. Okay, mise-en-scene or the shot composition, how the scene is framed and where things are positioned. This is a great film technique because literally every single second of the film you could analyze using this particular film technique. The example we're gonna use here is Travis posing for Moran's photograph. Moran tells the First Nations people to get down and as a result, they are positioned below Travis in the shot, reflecting the social hierarchy across Australia. Additionally, the rifle, a Western influence, is placed in the middle of the frame, mirroring Moran's desire to tame the land and people and maintain complete control and power. You could also go into a bit more detail there with um, with the rope. There's a symbol of the rope that's used to sort of tie down the crocodile as well, and this idea of taming the land. Um, but again, you know, this film technique works really well for pretty much any single scene or any single sequence. Note once again the use of a quotation in order to really strengthen that particular analysis. Symbols. Symbols are featured throughout the film. They are obviously objects or ideas. A motif is, is obviously a recurring idea that happens throughout the film. And these add extra meaning or provide, I guess, more emphasis on a particular point that the director is trying to make. The example we'll use here is John Braddock putting the Bible away before the massacre. The explanation, the Bible being hidden, suggests that the officers won't act in a Christian way. That means, you know, without compassion, morality and respect. Note the incomplete church and the blank expressions of church attendees with symbolism, which symbolizes the relatively low impact of religion on First Nations people. So here we see that motif of religion that appears throughout the film and the Bible is obviously one of the key symbols. You could also talk about the um, Bible verse that John Braddock reads. Uh, it's from Isaiah. It's, it's quite, um, quite ironic as well. So we'll look at sound now. We've got diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound. We'll start with diegetic sound, which is sound that originates from within the world of the film. So both characters and the audience can hear it. In the opening scene or the establishing sequence of the film, horses can be heard galloping and birds can be heard chirping. There are so many sounds of wildlife throughout this film to really immerse the audience within it, particularly calls from birds. The explanation, the sound of the horses galloping provides the audience with an ominous feeling of suspense 
in the build-up to the massacre. It also immerses the audience within Arnhem Land and the ever-present reminder of wildlife. So if you've got didactic sound, which is you know sound from within the film, non-didactic sound is from outside the world of the film. So another way really of saying non-didactic sound is sort of you know um, a, a soundtrack in this case with this particular film. The example we use here is the establishing and closing sequences where a soundtrack plays as the camera sweeps over Nimbawa Rock, which is a sacred site in Arnhem Land. The explanation. In the establishing sequence, non didactic First Nations music plays in the background as the camera moves towards the rock, establishing the setting of the film. This emphasises the pristine and sacred nature of the land and the need to preserve it. The fact the closing scene emulates the opening scene with the same shot of the rock allows the audience to immerse themselves in the setting whilst highlighting the cyclical nature of violence and dispossession faced by First Nations people. Yeah, solid explanation again. You could also mention the fact that obviously, you know, um, the rock is, is, is the highest point of this landscape, so you could reference that to the high ground as well if you wanted to. But yeah, non didactic sound, both in the opening or establishing and closing sequences. And voiceover. This is when a character narrates over the top of a scene with exposition or information. In this case, it's Moran describing the actions of the wild mob. Moran describes a wild mob as a bunch of miles, fugitives, bastards, and who are wreaking havoc. Moran is once again able to dictate the narrative, given he called the massacre a mess. So there's some you know, irony there in the fact that he describes this scene in far worse detail than he did of the massacre at the start of the film. Please note the contrast of this particular shot here of Baywara, who is faceless, with that when he meets Guchuk or reunites with Guchuk, where we see the soft lighting of Baywara's face. Because we move from, I guess, Moran's narrative to Guchuk's point of view, um, Baywara is provided with more humanity. So you could contrast this with the shots later on in this sequence. When it comes to writing on film techniques, make sure you provide context to the specific scene. Please also be explicit in using meta language to show your understanding. So don't be afraid to use specific film techniques. Always explain why it is used as well. Every choice, every scene, every shot has a purpose. Think about what you see, where it's positioned. Think about the order they are in. Think about what you hear as well. And there are some sentence starters there if you would like them. So Johnson employs, utilizes or implements a film technique when depicting or portraying a particular scene in order to highlight, illustrate, emphasize or reflect. Your analysis could go in after that. Alternatively, you might use, you know, the director challenges or critiques or celebrates, endorses or champions an idea through the inclusion, implementation of a film technique in order to highlight, reflect or underline a particular point or idea. Again, you can play it around with those sentence starters. You could start with a verb. You know, challenging the audience's perspective on A and B, the director employs you know, the film technique in order to highlight and you can fill in whatever point you're trying to make there. So start thinking about particular film techniques and what each one is trying to do. Don't forget your directorial intent verbs. So on the left hand side, we could use these verbs to outline, I guess, the positive messages that Johnson is trying to send to the audience. So what is he promoting, endorsing, celebrating, championing or supporting in the film? And on the other hand, the right hand side is the more negative messages that he's sending. So what is he condemning, challenging, critiquing, decrying, denouncing? There are definitely more than five verbs for each one, but those are the verbs that I like to use when it comes to directorial intent. Let's look at an example scene. We've looked at this one already earlier on today, actually. So we've got Moran meeting with DARPA in the example scene. So we've got three film techniques that I've picked out here. The fact it's a long shot, which highlights the clear gap between two cultures. The costuming, obviously the First Nations people blend in with nature and shows their deep connection to the land, whereas Moran looks a bit more out of place. And the mise-en-scene, which is Travis positioned between the two parties. So we've got some sample sentence starters here. You know, Johnson employs a long shot to illustrate the vast difference between the two cultures with DARPA's steady approach in seeking peace. 
and Moran's refusal to compromise. This is emphasising by their contrasting costumes with Moran's white suit, and you go into more detail there about how his suit definitely doesn't fit in and reflects his inflexibility. Uh, another sentence starter we've got here by framing Travis in between the two groups. Johnson, Johnson presents his internal conflict. Yes, he is definitely stuck between, obviously, the position he finds himself in with privilege, um, being non-Indigenous, but also that of his morals and wanting to do the right thing. So, uh, again, notice that you can't really mention everything, but pick out, you know, one or two film techniques in your example scene and focus on the messages that Johnson is trying to send. So, in summary, remember that film techniques do not work in isolation, but they work together to construct and tell the story of the film. So, therefore, try and consider scenes where multiple film techniques are used, and in fact, scenes where you can bring in quotations as well to really strengthen those. Now, avoid using the film, the term film techniques explicitly in your essays where possible. So, for example, a sentence we see a lot in exams is something really broad, like the director uses a range of film techniques in order to tell the story, or something to that effect. Um, again, try and avoid those sentences. They're, they're pretty obvious. Of course, every film contains film techniques. Just go straight to your example and be really specific with the scenes you're using and the film techniques that you are analysing. Try to aim for examples which are more unique as well and always analyse your evidence. Explain the purpose behind Johnson's choices because remember that every decision that Travis, uh, that Travis Johnson, former footy player, no, um, Stephen Johnson makes uh, is purposeful. That's, I guess, a brief, a really brief look at film techniques. You definitely should be going into more detail as you watch the film and really pinpointing um, so many of these film techniques and why they're used. And you might pick up on some others as well, because this is definitely not an exhaustive list. But good luck with your focus on film techniques, because they're going to come in very handy when it comes to the SAC and the exam.